Hi, I'm Dr. Allison Justice, and I am owner-founder of The Hemp Mine. We are a vertically integrated cannabis company out of South Carolina. Um, I also founded and, and lead the CRC, which is the Cannabis Research Coalition. Um, it is a farmer-supported research entity uh, that produces immediate farmer uh, results. You're listening to the Curious About Cannabis podcast. Special thanks to our current annual educational event sponsors, including The Workshop, CBD National, and Green Earth Medicinals. If you want to learn more about our Curious About Cannabis events, go to cacpodcast.com slash events. And if your company would like to become an event sponsor, visit cacpodcast.com slash sponsors to learn more. Hey, everybody, this is Jason Wilson with the Curious About Cannabis podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in once again. Today, I'm really excited to finally be joining somebody who we've been trying to arrange this podcast for literally almost a year, and different things in life came up, um, and we had to reschedule and reschedule, and we finally got connected. I'm here with Dr. Allison Justice of the Hip Mine out of South Carolina uh, to talk all about the science of growing and harvesting, drying, curing, everything with cannabis plants. Um, Allison, thanks so much for <laughs> your patience and, and finally making it on the podcast. It's a great pleasure. No, I, I'm so happy to be here. Um, <laughs> it was interesting, the back and forth we had to go through, but you know what? Now's the time. That's right. Now's the best time. It, it worked. And for anybody listening who's, um, I think probably most folks are, that listen to the podcast are probably somewhat familiar with your work and have seen you around, but do you mind giving just a little bit of background into kind of your story and, um, and your experience, you know, going back to uh, moving out to California? And I know you did some work with um, uh, Marcus Rogan and all sorts of people through the years. Um, so you mind giving yeah. us some, some highlights from some of that story and bring us to today? For sure. So in short, I, I got my PhD from Clemson University in South Carolina uh, in plant science. After that, I did consulting for a couple of years, mainly with IPM, Integrated Pest Management. Um, all of my research and studies in grad school, um, and actually, you know, part of my, my family farm was ornamentals. So, you know, the things that are pretty and you, you put in your yard. Um, so that is what my consulting was for mainly, but just so happened to get a call for cannabis. And so, you know, after thinking back and forth for a little while, because again, being from the Southeast and, oh gosh, I guess that was 2014, 15, mm -hmm. um, you know, hemp wasn't even around yet. So I uh, took the leap anyways and loved it, fell in love with the plant, fell in love with, you know, the research that could go into it, um, you know, all the things that are needed horticulturally, not even yeah. to mention medically. Um, and of course, I, I love the plant itself. I appreciated it. I just didn't grow up with hands on like many were lucky to. Um, let's see. So after that, I decided, well, this is something I want to get into. And to do that, I'm going to have to move. And so I packed my bags and I moved to, to San Diego. Um, where I had got a job with a vertically integrated uh, new startup. And that is actually where I met Dr. Rogan. Um, nice. He was my counterpart in extraction. So I led the, the growing, um, he led the extraction, and we both kind of tag team the drying and curing. You know, there's a little bit of, little bit of biology, a little bit of chemistry. Yeah, and right. so um, it was really fun to, to work with him um, and, and have perspectives from, from both areas. Um, stayed there for about three and a half years, but halfway through South Carolina passed a bill for hemp. And so my, my family all being farmers, I mean, even, you know, great, great grandparents, um, I encouraged my mom to apply and she got one of the first 20 licenses. Nice. And granted today is, you know, to get a hemp license, you pretty much just got to 
depending where you are in South Carolina, you just got to pass a background check and, and, and then write them a check. Right, exactly. um, <laughs> but then, you know, it was, it was something to be fought over. Um, so I bounced back and forth for about a year, year and a half, and then eventually decided it's time to come home um, and, and do something, you know, ha- have a business, a, a thing for myself. Well, that's, that's super cool because obviously I can relate to that story as well because there's a lot of parallels there during my journey to Oregon and then coming back and trying to figure out how to apply that. So I can imagine um, what your experience was like. You know, I mean, you, you really dove into the deep end at like the perfect time. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, that, yeah, 2014 or so, I mean, that's even, I think Oregon went legal in 2016, I think, something like that. Um, so it was even before then, you know, so it really was um, at this really cool sweet spot um, and where there were a lot of unknowns, a lot of questions. I mean, we still have tons of questions to research, obviously, but I mean, back then there was so little, um, you know, serious uh, research that was happening around things that like growers cared about or that, you know, mm-hmm. extractors cared about, that producers really cared about, or even really that patients cared about. Um, and so one thing I wanted to touch, cause I remember, was it back in like 2016 or 2017, I think you gave a presentation with Dr. Rogan on light intensity, some experiments, um, that y'all were doing back then. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Um, if you can dig some cobwebs out of the brain and go, <laughs> go back yeah. that far <laughs> yeah, for right. some of those projects. Oh, let's see. So that was actually an experiment, um, I took on with Fluence, mm-hmm. the LED manufacturer, and that relationship came about because uh, Josh Garavac, who was there at the time, he's not with them anymore. Um, we were in grad school at the same time. So nice. he was at Purdue. I was at Clemson. And so we met at conferences, um, you know, how all the students yep. will get together oh, yeah. at those conferences. And, and so we had met. Um, I had no idea he was in cannabis. Uh, and he heard through the grapevine that I was and so was excited. You know, they wanted to to do some um, legitimate research, put some data, you know, do bigger sizes than what they could do in their chambers. And um, when he called, I was like, absolutely, let's, you know, let's do this. Yeah. Yeah, I got to go talk to the, the upper management and <laughs> convince them, <laughs> but I think I can do it. That's what they brought me here for, yeah, right? The science right. And, and bringing the new ideas and, and methods. So um, that was a, a easy conversation. And we started to... Uh, get to work. The basis of the experiment was looking at how light intensity affected yield. Yeah. And so it was interesting because at the time they did not have commercial lights that could get up over 1200 right, right. Uh, micromole. And so they had to actually manufacture special ones for the experiment. Um, and then we had, we had about four, four levels below 1200 with believing that 1200 would, would max it out, you know, show some burn, things like that. Um, and then we also compared to HPS and, you know, the, the big takeaway was the more light intensity, the better yield. You know, that was, Mm -hmm. that was very obvious. I don't think anybody could, could debate that. Um, but we also found, and was yield, um, defined as like pure, um, like biomass or resin concentration, what was, um, how was yield defined in that study? I don't remember. So we defined it as shoved flour. Okay. So basically, you know, you, you take all the gotcha. flowers off yeah. the stems. Yep. Um, you know, that, that could have been perfected a little more coarse and had true no. flour versus popcorn and, and, and yada, yada, but. There's um, a million iterations. At least, yeah. We'd love to oh, do on every sure. study. Yeah. For sure. We had to start somewhere. And just from there, you know, you add on top of it. So that is where we started. Um, The other thing that we thought was going to happen was that, like I said, the 1200 was going to kind of max it out. Um, And as far as the yield goes, it did not. It could have took more light. You know, we could have gained more weight. But, you know, with with this certain variety we were using, that high of light, cause some funky things to happen, you know, some foxtailing, yeah, okay. um, you know, whether it was speeding up the cycle or, or, or whatnot, the, they didn't look as frosty and, and mm-hmm. nice as you would expect for an indoor. 
um, blood to be, whereas the lower uh, the lower treatments were. So, you know, I think there's some give and take with the plant and by variety to, to be able to say, you know, this variety, if you get it to a thousand micromoles, you can max out your yield, but it still look nice. Right, um, right. And, and just kind of determine that by variety in your situation. Um, but it was, it was some pretty nice takeaways that I don't think had at that time hadn't been looked at. Um, there was one study out that showed that actually measured photosynthesis mm-hmm. and that had similar results where it showed, you know, more light, increased photosynthesis. Um, but putting that behind some numbers and behind, uh, you know, marijuana versus hemp right. um, was, was pretty cool for the time. Yeah, definitely. And, and measuring it in terms of like your harvest yield, that's something that's very easy for people to understand and and wrap their head around, whereas like photosynthetic rates and everything, you're like, what does that actually mean for the end? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the exactly. end product. Um, well, that's fascinating. And then how did things um, progress from there? At what point did you, uh, I can't remember what year you said, when did you decide to go back to South Carolina? So that was, I believe, mid-2018. Again, another, you chose your timing really well. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The first time wasn't on purpose. <laughs> yeah, that's that's and and it was pretty much seeing the farm bill passing, your mom taking it seriously, saying, "Okay, we're going to get the family farm involved and see where this goes." How did the family? Um, what was the initial sort of response when you presented this idea of like, "Hey, I've, this is how we could use the farm," and um, you know, there's a big industry coming behind this um, that we should be paying attention to. Um, what sort of reactions were you met with? Well, you know, my, my family, they, they really don't drink or smoke, you know, pretty much nothing. And I, and I was raised that way. Um, Same. Yeah. Obviously black, black sheep of the of the family, but (laughs) (laughs) I kind of ripped the bandaid off when I just up and moved to California to grow marijuana. So, you know, uh, saying that, Hey, here's a crop that, you know, you, you, from me being here and you visiting, you've under you've come to understand how this this plant can help people. Here is a plant that you know we can put all our skills towards. Um, you know, I've got some tips and tricks because I've been doing this yeah. a few years, and um, you know it, it, it's something we can grow and have a, a little bit better margin than growing vines. <laughs> yes, um, and you know, and for my my mom, it, you know, it was something that is not getting people high but it is a medicine and so you know that was something she needed to uh it was important for her Mm -hmm. and so it you know because of those things it it wasn't a big challenge having them you know everybody get involved that's awesome that's really cool um yeah and that's it it does make sense like well you already ran away across across the whole country um to go study this plant so the idea that we might get you back uh, we're not going to argue too much um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's really cool. And, and getting to, to some of the heart of uh, what I'm really interested to talk to you about is something that's been on my mind a lot since moving back to the Southeast is what sort of challenges did you run into when you start trying to cultivate cannabis in the Southeast versus, you know, the West Coast and more arid environments? It's a it's very much a, a different ballgame. Of course, indoor is indoor to some degree, but even that is affected by, you know, the outside environmental conditions and everything. Um, what were some of, you know, some, some challenges that either yourself or other growers that, you know, you were, you know, seeing around the Southeast as you came back, what were they, you know, dealing with that, you know, folks out West maybe are not so accustomed to having to deal with? Well, well first I got to tell you the story, how we even got plants. Yes, please. <laughs> So the you know South Carolina is just going. I don't know what the heck to do. You know how you know there was seed stopped in the oh, mail, yeah, put yeah, in yeah. purgatory for a year, <laughs> and um, you know we finally got clearance from the ag department. And people at this time people just didn't like to give answers because they really right, didn't right. know. Um, and so them having an answer you know, puts liability on them, but finally we had enough suggestions that, (laughs) (laughs) well, let me back up again. So, uh, you know, myself, my mom, you know, we're all from ornamentals where 
most of propagation is is um, is vegetative, yeah. and so you know cloning is is what we have done for years and years, and so you know we're at that time thinking, okay, seed cheap, probably easier to get, but clones equates to uh, safety, and so again at that time, mom. Mom was really worried we were going to end up with marijuana plants and, you yeah. know, get a license to it. Yada, yada, yeah. Yada. yeah. <clears throat> and, and so her thought was finding, um, you know, legitimate hemp farmers out west and driving out there and getting clones. And so she did. Wow. And so I was still nice. in California. Uh, her and my dad flew out to San Diego, rented a giant. I guess it was like a suburban XL or you know, something <laughs> yes, like that. Yes. Windows blacked out. <laughs> um, I had gathered some plants from, you know, from California area. And then they were going to go, where did they go? They went to Northern California and then they went to Colorado because mm-hmm. they wanted to get a few different varieties because yeah. we didn't know what would work well. But at that time, the the uh, federal bill hadn't passed, and so it was just certain states <laughs> that were legal. And so they drove. Mom was not altering the legal path. She drove from San Diego all the way up to South Dakota, North Dakota, wow. all the way back down. And, you know, it was this crazy path to go through legal states yeah. to get back to South Carolina. And, you know, wow, they would they geez. would pull the plants out every night at a hotel and have <laughs> lights on them. Oh, I hope she doesn't listen to this podcast. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. And when they wow. were in North Dakota, there was a snowstorm. <laughs> <laughs> Wrap them up. What a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> but wow. they made it. And they made it. Wow. Made what it. a journey. And that's, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a, (laughs) that's a journey that uh, they'll be talking about forever. That's amazing. Absolutely. I I was, I was so impressed. (laughs) And they made it to the end. They made it. The plants were alive. They were alive. No tickets, nothing. Wow. But once we, you know, we got these plants that were from, you know, farmers that had been doing it a year or two and had COAs and had confidence and. You know, they even got to see a lot of it when they were in Colorado. And so, you know, we we knew you've got to start somewhere. It's not like you can go out in the backyard in South Carolina and just find a native, you know, great hemp plant. So um, that was the start. And very quickly we saw that plants that do well in other regions do not necessarily do well in the southeast. Um, you know, photo period's a big one. Um it, you know, it, there are some pretty drastic changes as you go yeah. much further north. Um, and so that was one of the biggest uh, kick in the ass was having, you know, a thousand clones planted out right time of the year, planted, mm-hmm. you know, healthy, filled, optimized, and they grow, you know, a foot tall in flower. Oh, yes. that yeah, that yeah. was quite devastating and you know the farmers like or actually this batch was from a breeder out of colorado and they're just like i don't know you right. know yeah mm, sorry and uh and then you know the ones that would grow to a you know a expected size um a lot of them were just completely destroyed by the heat and humidity mm-hmm. Yeah. Which yields the crazy fungal diseases we get here yeah. that, you know, are just native in the soil. There's, right. there's nothing you can do about yep. it. Absolutely. Um, and so all you can lean on is um, that natural resistance plus expecting some sort of loss. Yeah. Um, it's got better and better over the years, but um, that's just kind of how it was. And so, you know, I, I, I'm not a geneticist by training. Um, but after seeing all the fails of not only our farm and some varieties, but other farms, um, <laughs> some of the other farms fails were buying seed and it being marijuana. Right. One guy F2s. had five acres. <laughs> yeah. One, one farm had, I think it was 10 acres of 8% <laughs> <laughs> THC Whoops. hemp. Whoopsie. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, 
you know, at first it was, well, I, I got to at least have something nice to grow here. So it started just for purpose of our own farm. But but then as we saw the horror story after horror story, mm-hmm. well, it's time to, you know, to, to, to take this commercial. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And did that lead to, um, like, have you been doing selecting, like trying to notice what, um, you know, uh, what sort of uh, varieties that you're working with seem to be more resistant to some of these fungal diseases? Now that you're several years in, are you starting to notice some of those trends that you can select for and develop genetic lines that are more suited for the southeast and kind of where you're at? Absolutely, absolutely. So at the beginning, it it all was selection, right? They right. don't just magically appear. Yep. Um. So it was it was selection, and you know, of course, not everything that not everything that grows well has other variables that are yeah. also awesome. Right. You know, just because it grows well doesn't mean you know maybe it's got one percent CBD or yeah. something to that effect. So. It, it definitely took a while to find, you know, those winners that checked one box or the other, and then it became, all right, well, how to, you know, let's let's cross these and find mm-hmm. ones that that check more boxes, and then it just kind of built on top of there, and and slowly built into <sighs> really what what looks and smells like marijuana. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, especially it is. in yeah in the southeast. And, and other states where there's not medical or rec, um, that's what people want is is that smokable flower, or that's at least where the greater margins are yes. for a farmer. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing that immediately struck me when I moved back, seeing, I mean, you know, I was familiar with all of the CBD smokable flower, you know, Oregon CBD, you know, was, was out where I was and everything. So I was very familiar with a lot of the breeding and different things that had been going on. But it didn't really strike me until, you know, like you were saying, you, you come back to the southeast and you see that this stuff is in shops like all over the place. And you're, you're like, this has a very strong terpenoid profile. Like this is, you know, uh, the early, early stuff that, that came out. I remember some of the old like ACDC, um, you know, varieties that were actually high CBD. A lot of times like their their terpene profiles were not great. Um and things like that. But I was like, these, I mean, they smell, they look, they, you know, you would not be able to differentiate these by looking at them at all. And and then that made me wonder how that affects law enforcement in places like the Southeast where, you know, these are still prohibitionist states, but now it, it becomes much harder to use, um, you know, excuses like, oh, we smell marijuana. And so mm-hmm. we're going to kick in their door and go seize all their stuff which is something that's very common for the police to do in places like this. Um, and so it's it's something that's kind of been uh, going on in my mind. Like, I know these states are slow to change their laws, but it seems like just, just with the introduction of hemp, it really changes the game substantially, even on the high THC side in the black market and everything, because it really gets to the situation of, like, how do you use smell anymore for a reason to search people um, you know, people can legally have this stuff and cross state lines with it and everything to some degree, depending on the state. Um, so it's just, uh, it's fascinating what such a seemingly small change and just bringing hemp online, um, how that, that trickles out and how it's affected the culture. I've noticed so many more people than when I left the Southeast are totally fine with cannabis now. Um, and actively like bring me questions and stuff, asking me about different products, bringing me test results. I'm like, this is a whole new world. It's like, where did this yeah. come from? It's really yeah. wild. Yeah, it's pretty cool. You know, as far as cops go, you know, like I said, they pushed and pushed until the attorney general put put a letter out. But you know, on one on one hand, I can see where. Uh, let me before everybody gets mad hearing this let me finish yes sure you know so i i can <laughs> i can see where from a cop's perspective you know where we're meant to enforce the law and the law is that this is illegal you know sure i've i've somebody's got weed in their their they've got a bag in their car and then they've got a hemp coa with it right which i have interns that work at at 
uh, my facility a lot because we're right beside Clemson, and uh, you know they they slip yeah. up and tell stories. Yes, yeah. Uh, so heard, on one hand, yes. it is being took advantage of. On the other hand, like duh, just you know, <laughs> this shouldn't be the way it is anyways. Right. But so be it. Um, but it's been interesting. I have you know friends I went to high school with that are cops, and they tell me. We're just told not to even mess with it anymore. If it yeah. looks or smells like weed, just and they're not, you know, incapacitated right, or something right. crazy, um, or or if it's, you know, if it's a giant truckload and they have hemp paperwork, you know, <laughs> good, let them go. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're just not wasting their time with it, which is great. That's how it should be. Um, but then there's certain counties where, um, you know, they'll raid the smoke shop once a month yeah yeah, i mean it's ridiculous and then but then they end up getting sued because the smoke shop says everything's legal here's my paperwork and so that's slowing down yeah um because it's it's ending up being more trouble than it's worth yep but it's it's kind of about the attitude of the law enforcement in that county with how they approach it but it's certainly changed since you know since we started yeah, no, absolutely. That destigmatization has definitely been happening, um, and kind of silently for a long time. And now it's it's really shining through, which is really cool. Um, and <clears throat> going back to your story, so we we've now we've gotten plants. We've started selecting, trying to figure out um, things that will kind of thrive more in the southeast. One thing I wanted to ask you about: Do you have to deal with flooding very much? Because it's something like in Tennessee, some of the hemp growers I've seen here have really had problems just in trying to figure out um, how to set up their their farms to be um, resistant to flooding. Because a lot of them kind of just initially set out like smart pots like they had seen in Colorado, Oregon, and then they all got flooded out and they lost their crops in like 2018, 2019. Um, right. That's something that you've had to deal with. You know, farm is... It's not in an area where a flood would affect it. Good, um, yeah. At least as far as, you know, being stuck in two foot of water for a, mm-hmm. a week. Right. Um, there's certainly some areas uh, in grad school, Clemson's organic plot is in this, you know, it's in this <laughs> valley. Intention, yeah. Yeah, and I have seen it, you know, stay at two foot for weeks. Um, so, you know, of course, the, the the first thing is try to avoid that, but not everybody can. Um, so my, my second sort of go-to there would be um, uh, would be to use raised beds. Yeah. And so, you know, I tell people to, to raise it as high as they can because we will have bouts of, you know, four weeks drought. Right. And you need to be able to water and you want to keep that water in. So the, you know, the, the mulch helps with that. Um, but then we'll have a hurricane come through yep. and it'll just rain for days. And even though it's not standing in two foot of water, you know, the, they're still really, really wet and it's going to take a long time to dry out. So just having it on a, a mound definitely helps. Yeah. But there's just some areas, you know, it's it's unavoidable. Yeah. But but for us, like even this year, um, the biggest thing is, I guess it's a combination between heavy rains from a hurricane and the mm. wind. Wind, yeah. And so yeah. yeah, the the roots will get, you know, the soil will get wet, um, really soft, and then the wind blows and they just topple over. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. This year, actually, um, a hurricane came through, and and we're three and a half hours off the coast. So, yeah. You know, it's not like we're right on on the coast. That's pretty those much how I am. Have it, yeah. It's yeah. Three hours, those farmers yeah. have it really rough that are closer. But you know, even still, if if it rains and then the winds blow, all of the plants will be pushed in one direction, and you know they're they're fine except they're just tilted to the side. And then, of course, that bottom part where it's touching the wet grass constantly, you know, that can, you know, cause some rot and things like that. But, um, yeah, it's kind of unavoidable. I mean, we had a a special area where I've got some, you know, trials going on that we have the netting, but, I mean, it's expensive to buy the T-posts and yeah. and do acres and acres and acres. Um, 
if, especially for hemp. I see people doing it with marijuana, and that makes a, a little more sense, yeah. um, you know, because they have better return. But with hemp, it's it's hard to it's hard to go that far. Well, and the, the scale of hemp is at a level that I mean, in some places, um, you know, THC rich cannabis is is kind of getting there with indoor grows and things, but still some of the scales of, of hemp, you know, we're, we're seeing just full scale agriculture. Um, and it is just a very different ball game completely. You don't really have the luxury of being able to really, um, take care of all the plants to the same degree that you would in a, in a smaller grow or in smaller indoor grow or something, keeping them all propped up and, you know, well taken care of. <clears throat> um, so there are all those trade-offs depending on how big you go. Um, right what you're able to do and and what about the the photo period issue i meant to come back to that you know so you you planted these these plants and they came out about a foot and a half tall or so and then went to flower which i've seen plants like that i know exactly what you're talking about uh mm -hmm. i they look like little spears like they look like little swords yeah. or something coming up because they have like a main cola <laughs> right. a couple little off branches um how did how did that problem how did you kind of um start to address that issue because obviously that's a huge one when you're expecting much greater uh, yields than that. Yeah, especially in your, I think that that specific example was your two. But, you know, if, if you're looking at prices of just crude oil in 2018, like right. $7,000. And then so in 19, went down to, you know, two to three. Yeah. And now it's like 300. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> so having a loss then of, you know, expecting an acre with very minimal, you know, ungrown area because it just basically where the rows were to being <laughs> four grams a plant, that's a big, big problem. Oh, yeah. But I have to, um, but it, it really, uh, you know, when I, when I was in California, we, we grew indoors mostly and that's easy. You know, you've got a switch which controls your, your lighting. Um, greenhouse we had, blackout curtains, you know, photoperiodic lighting. And we had an outdoor, but that was only grown once a year, you know, one big crop. Mm -hmm. And they were able, it was in Northern California, and they had varieties that they'd grown there before. So tried so, and true, mm -hmm. you know, no worry. Well, in South Carolina, you know, these varieties, we just we didn't know what they were going to do. And so after, you know, having such experiences, I, I understood we really need to understand, you know, how, what is causing these plants to flower at certain times. Well, I said that wrong. What What is the flower initiation times? Yeah, yeah, right. So, you know, are these things auto flowers? Are there are some auto flowers sometimes, you know, Back then, there was just so much to figure out because you can't just turn it 12 on, 12 off, um, yeah. at, you know, 18 hours on when you're out in the field. And again, growing big acreage, you know, you're not going to have a blackout cloth. I'm not going to pull, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not going to build hoop houses on 60 acres. I'm imagining, blackout cloth. Yeah, I'm imagining 60 <laughs> acres just pulling this huge <laughs> cloth. Yeah, so you know, I took I took the varieties I had and tested them at different photo periods and in, inside. Yeah, and from nice. there was able to to grow on that. You know, push some to have later initiation times, select some for earlier, um, and have a nice combination where you have choices. Yeah, nice. That's yeah, that's a smart way to go about that. You know, bring it indoors, run some trials, um, start to select things out. And how was, um, you know, getting through 2020 and all of that sort of disruption? You know, on one side, 2020 disrupted a lot of people in the cannabis industry, both the hemp side and the THC side. But in some ways, it bolstered a lot of people, and some people did really well. Um, what was your experience of that whole ordeal, you know, trying to get closer now to where we are now? Um, what did 2020 and 2021 look like for you? Well, so, so we're vertical, mm -hmm. and so I got to kind of piece it apart by yeah, sure by what we do. Um, you know, when we had to close shop in South Carolina, I think 
maybe a month or so. You know, mm-hmm. people just were not allowed to work unless you're um, necessary. And so, you know, we're working from home and the retail shops that we sell to are closed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, there's panic for a little while. Like, what yeah. are we going to do? Um, online sales increased a little bit. And so that was good. You know, one of us would come come in here and prepare orders and things like that. It was yeah. a nightmare, but we made it happen. It was um, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, overall sales went down, but it wasn't as bad as I expected. People just finally caught on like, all right, well, we'll just order online. Might, mm-hmm. might not be something that those people didn't normally do, but, you know, with, with what they we had to deal with, they learned you. how. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then on the genetic cell side, I, you know, to be honest, I don't think COVID had a lot to do with it. I think it was the dry, dropping prices yeah, I mean, and the, the already oversupply <clears throat> of material. Yep. You know, there were still those people who, who, who loved it and were just going to grow it, if nothing else, just for fun. Yeah. Um, but it, it shifted from large acreage to large acreage growing just for cannabinoids extraction to more farmers, but much smaller areas. Mm -hmm. And so people, people growing for smokable flour. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was good. You know, more people interested, you know, uh, at least things leveling out for smokable flour, you know, having, having these varieties that I tested indoor and outdoor, Mm -hmm. you know, that I can, give really good recommendations and if you're if you know if you're growing for smokable flour you usually want clones and so you know that was kind of a thumbs up for us being a clone provider um but yeah it was i I think that huge dip was coming anyways regardless of of the virus yeah yeah just kind of the timing was was in perfect alignment and it's it's crazy because even when the hemp market was kind of really getting going, you know, 2014, you know, some of the research pilot programs came on and and then 2018 things really jumped off. And we knew at some point the CBD prices were going to crash. It had to happen Mm -hmm. at some point. Um, And and boy, did it happen. Um, It's dropped quite a bit. Um, And it's fascinating to see the push towards other things now, CBG, um, CBN. I I, I don't like see, I don't like seeing the trend that's happened where so many people are sitting on so much bulk CBD that they're like let's just chemically synthesize it into something else <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. and send that out the door and see what happens. Um, but uh, you know I think it's important for people to understand that one reason that that's happening is because of the price crash of CBD that happened around 2020. Um, it left people holding a lot of material that all of a sudden was not worth as much as it used to be. Um, so getting that switched into a molecule people will pay more for, um, is advantageous. So especially if it uh, gets you high. So, um, it's interesting, all of those dynamics. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about going back to, um, sort of the science of growing the plant. I know that you've done some work looking at, um, at terpenes. So I was talking about how in the early days, a lot of hemp varieties didn't really have a very strong terpenoid profile. And that's changed a lot these days. Um, and I know you gave a talk, I think it was last year. Was it last year at CanMed? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, this past year. Yeah. You gave a talk about um, considerations for drying and curing. And I thought they were really, really um, good points to make for anybody that's, that's considering um, or is already involved in cannabis cultivation and they want to understand, you know, um, uh, sort of evidence driven, um, ideas on how to best harvest to preserve terpenoids, how to best dry to try to preserve terpenoid and cannabinoid content. Um, so do you mind speaking on that a little bit? We'll start with terpenes, um, since that's kind of where I started out and then we'll kind of dive down some other rabbit holes, but if someone's, cause that's important to you extracting, um, particularly, um, what considerations should cultivators have in mind if their plan is to try to preserve terpenoids? Because obviously some people are just harvesting huge amounts and shucking it in a machine and they don't really care. But for the people that do care and, and really value um, those components, what can you tell us about some of the science that's going on around the 
end of the plant's life cycle and, and what they should be thinking about? Well, you know, the, the first thing that comes to mind, and I feel like it's hard lessons learned in, in hemp, that mm -hmm. people should be, you know, reaching out and, and talking to some of these hemp grower scientists, whatnot, um, because we have been doing this on a much larger scale. And yes, it's a different plant or, or a different cannabinoid, different routes, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, you know, I always say the, the biggest decision needs to be what are you going to do with it? Right. You know, if if you are just going to, let's say, just turn it to isolate, you know, no matter what the mm -hmm. cannabinoid isolate is, you know, why in the world are you spending millions building a giant warehouse where you can dry it 60 degrees and, you know, 60% right. humidity. Cause I have seen that happen. Mm -hmm. They're not in business anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. And you know, like in Michigan this year, I, I saw there was one place that was I think 60 acres and you know, going to hang it all. Oh, wow. And that's wow. fine. Yeah, yeah. If you know, if you have those next steps planned, um, but good gosh, you know, th there's other, it is a lot of work. And the thing is, there's a lot of technologies that are already, you know, took advantage of with other industries that, you know, if we back the science and research, um, you know, we can understand how to apply it to marijuana, yeah. um, or, or hemp, if you're looking to save the terps. <laughs> um, and so, you know, on large scale, I did some research with a company that makes large, um, large nitrogen, liquid nitrogen infuser. So basically mm -hmm. to zap, mm -hmm. zap freeze right. the flower and, you know, being able to take advantage of that equipment that, you know, they've been using the same equipment in, meat storage and yep, you know yep. certain vegetable storage mm -hmm. that you need to freeze the stuff immediately because every second it sits at room temperature is going to degrade especially after it's well after it's picked right um and so you know i i've guided a few grows to you know take advantage of this because if let's say you're doing full spectrum or if you want to press it or if you want to um you know make bubble hash it's all going to have to be frozen and again, especially if you're in the southeast, every second counts because yeah. it still might be hot outside and it might take an hour to load it, an hour to get back to your freezer. Yep. And okay. then you're in a freezer that if if you haven't you know, calculated things properly and not put it in in a container that's that you would use for hemp, you mm -hmm. know, four by four, let's say, you know, the middle of that flour is not going to freeze you know there's still microbes growing on there and just a regular old freezer can't handle it so you know why don't we go through mechanically pull that flour um or you could do it by hand whatever and then you can run it very quickly you know there there's pieces of equipment that do 50,000 pounds a day yeah, yeah. you know run it through this equipment <clears throat> freeze it instantly you know, have everything preserved there at your fingertips and then go into a freezer yeah. um, and, and it can last and, you know, you can work on it throughout the year, that sort of thing. So, you know, freezing, uh, I'd say, can definitely be approved or improved upon versus just having those chest freezers and, yeah. you know, expecting to be able to buy 50 of those and and have it go smooth. Um <laughs> So I think those states that are allowing for such big production really need to think about alternative alternative methods versus just scaling up, mm -hmm. you know, what somebody would do in a, uh, on a small scale. Um, and that, that's kind of where the struggle came from with, uh, you know, you think about we've got legacy growers who, you know, had smaller, smaller locations but they did it perfectly yeah, yeah. and you know they know what the plant needs they know how to grow it but when you say all right well times this by 500 times the size you know there there might be scaling problems and some time needed to you know well let's not hand water let's upgrade yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's the same sort of idea there you know when, when looking at freezing um 
But as far as, you know, just straight up drying for smokable flour, you know, we've, we, we're starting to learn a lot. And so this is work um, mainly done by Clips University through the CRC, um, where we're starting to look at, and, and with some things we found out so far, some things I can share, some, some I can't, but, you know, looking at ethylene, mm-hmm. you know, how much is, is being produced in the plant? How much is being produced while you're drying? How much is being produced when you're curing? Um, how does that correlate with burping? You know, right. the first step was just knowing what's there. And so it wasn't just ethylene. It was other things like, and, and for those who don't know what ethylene is, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a, basically a ripening hormone. The plant produces itself, um, but you can also apply it, um, you know, externally, like ban- bananas, for example. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, they'll be sent to the stores green, and then they're hit with this gas, and they'll ripen really quickly. Um, so, you know, coming coming from the ornamentals industry, that was something I was very familiar of um, because we were doing some work with a poinsettia companies where they were shipping mm-hmm. plants from Guatemala to the U.S. Um, that's where all of our uh, – 99% of our poinsettia cuttings come from. And so by cuttings, I mean just a, a clone without roots. Right, right. Um, those are sent to the U.S., propagated, and then – you know, uh, American greenhouses grow all the poinsettias out that are in our grocery stores and whatnot. Um, but shipping those live plants, you know, it's important to pull that ethylene out, have ethylene blockers, because ethylene at high concentrations will call it, cause it to rot really quick. Um, and so you think about cannabis, well, you know, we're not wanting to keep these flowers alive. Sure, yeah. Like you would the, the cuttings. But you also don't want them to theoretically rot really quick. Yeah. But they're also not rotting because we're drying them slow enough. So, or, or drying ideally. them enough to, a, yeah. yeah, ideally. Um, so, you know, that was certainly on my mind is understanding what effect that has. Um, but then we also looked at CO2, O2, you know, how those gases are changing um, during the drying curing and, um you know, really finding some interesting things. I guess one of the biggest takeaways for, for ethylene specifically was that in drying, it was producing crazy amounts. Yeah. You know, and it was still alive. It was still wet. And as as it gets drier, it, it, it slows down that ethylene production. But the, the amounts there at the beginning are extremely high, you know, well above avocados and, and other plants that produce a lot of ethylene. Um, and so, you know, we went as far as adding more ethylene, using ethylene blockers, and there wasn't a ton of difference. Um, not a ton. I think there's some more work to be done there, but at these, you know, very high level, you know, we're still very exploratory experiments. Um, it didn't make a huge difference. The other thing, and is there any, um, I just don't know a whole lot about ethylene. It's not something I've studied much. Um, are there any issues, <clears throat> you know, in, I'm thinking about some of these um, drying containers that I've been in, you know, shipping containers that have been converted to drying rooms and stuff that are packed full. And, you know, you walk through and you're obviously breathing in whatever is is emitting into the air. Is there any concern over um emissions exposure or anything once it gets kind of concentrated in these buildings i mean ideally you've got air exchange happening but sure yeah it's not to a level where it would be harmful for a human good okay for sure i think if, if you were to put uh, another plant in the room with those drying cannabis plants yeah, you struggle. might see some funky <laughs> curling and, and things like that now but, that would be uh, no, that would be human, an interesting to experiment to grow other plants where cannabis plants are drying and see what happens <laughs> That is yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Well, and uh, another thing I wanted to highlight that you said that some folks maybe hadn't thought about that I just thought was, you know, neat that you pointed it out, you know, that when you you take these, when you're harvesting and you're taking these cuttings, so not cuttings like cloning, but cutting, you know, just taking, cutting branches down to dry, that technically these things are still alive for a while, while they're sitting there hanging. Um, they are breathing, you know, so to speak. Um, and 
you know, still um, interacting with their environment to some degree. Uh, and I just think that's something worth noting because people probably don't think about the fact that, you know, all of these bits of plant that are hanging on these on these racks, at least at first, like they're still all technically alive. Um, and it's, it's important to note, there's still a lot of interesting um, chemistry going on and a lot of interesting dynamics going on, even when it just seems like they're sitting still and drying out. Yeah, absolutely. You know, people, people like to say that there's always two sides here, right? There are some extremists that say curing is nothing. You don't need to do it. You know, there's some that say you've got to cure for two months or it's (laughs) terrible. Yeah. Um, And so, you know, I have always just kind of been like, "Hmm, let's find out. You know, I don't, I don't have an opinion towards it. Uh, The, the more I'm in it, I have, I have seen I've seen, I've smelt the effects of curing. And so I believe there's something there to it, but all I have is guesses. I mean, that's all any of us have to to worry about to put some data behind it. Um, But, you know, I I think we need to look at it more as it's not drying and curing. It's just post-harvest handling. Um, And it's all about the, the exchange. It's all about the time the plant's, I call it in a zombie form, you yeah. know, where it's, it's dead. You've, you've cut it. It's not going to grow back, Undead. but yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it it's still doing plant things. You know, it's, yeah. it's still um, respiring, throwing out moisture. It, it, you know, it's still alive. And, you know, when that plant is alive, when it has a certain amount of moisture still in it, it can still do enzymatic activities. Yeah, yeah. And so that's a really crucial piece that um, Mike at Clemson is looking into pretty hard. Um, You know, those things that we've been guessing for years, you know, is it chlorophyll degradation? Mm -hmm. Is it starch to sugar conversion, which I sit on that one really heavily. I mean, that Mm -hmm. it's got to be. I mean, think of uh, going back to other plants. Think about yeah. a banana. Yeah. You know, when when it's green, it's full of starch. Yep. When it starts rotting, that's the conversion to sugars. So certainly, cannabis is doing that too. And then when you go and compare it to papers uh, looking at tobacco, I mean, they used to even add sugar to cigarettes for a better taste. So <laughs> certainly, there is, you know, there is benefit. You know, whether whether it's the drying or curing part, it's yeah. something in post handling where we're having benefit from that conversion. And so how do we speed up that conversion? And so this is where, you know, I find all of these um, these legacy grower um uh, all the things they've been doing for so many years that, you know, at first glance it's like, eh, you know, that, that doesn't make sense horticulturally compared to da, 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 da. Sure, yeah. But you know what, it, now that, now that you think about it, well, maybe flushing is just speeding up. Mm-hmm. Um, it's speeding up the senescence of that plant, which is already starting the cycle of the starch to sugar conversion and so there is some fact mm. to, you know, is it just removing nitrogen? Probably not. It, it, is it? Is it just a basically you're just starving the plant where it, it right. knows it's dying? So you know, I think there's some merit to it. Yeah, that, that could uh, we just gotta makes, yeah. make some sense, and it and it'd be really interesting to to compare just looking at plants that have been flushed versus those that haven't, and um the sort of subjective um curing times involved like at what point do you start to smell the smell of cannabis that you really you know are looking for um um that would be that would be interesting to do a whole bunch of times and average out and and see um but yeah like um theoretically just thinking about it it does make a ton of sense like trying to get these these processes going that are already going to be happening once you've cut it down and you're trying to dry it and cure it, um, but trying to go ahead and get the plant to realize, okay, we're switching our, our activity. We're going into sleep mode. We can, you know, slow down, um, working on a lot of growth stuff, um, and just finish up anything, uh, <laughs> and, and prepare for a long sleep. 
Um, exactly. You know, as, as the fall leaves are around me right now. Yeah, yeah. Which is one of the few things that's better than California. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, it's <laughs> is nice. the season changes. Yeah. The, oh, the leaves are so beautiful right now. But, you know, you think the days are getting shorter. Yeah. Um, fall, winter's coming. The leaves are senescing, falling off. You know, when you flush hard, those leaves are senescing. They do. And, they yellow you know, out and start to drop. And, yeah, it's, yeah. you know, it, it, it's a plant. And so just figuring out how to optimize what we want it to be. <laughs> exactly. That's the thing. Is, and do you know what you want it to be? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so uh, Mike that I was talking about at Clemson, he, he's doing flushing studies as well. Um, I think he's done five reps now. Nice. It's pretty intense. Um, and he's done it in soil, but then he's also done it with just, just, uh, you know, aquaculture, just water yeah, where he's cool, giving cool. it the nutrients. So flushing is really just going down to, you to know, nothing zero. added. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, the first studies were looking at yield and looking at, um, you know, a few other things, but with smell being mm -hmm. the, the most difficult data to collect it is. um you know of course if you're flushing four weeks ahead of harvest your yield is going to be worse um but looking at one in two weeks you know there's not that much difference on there's not significant statistical difference right. on yield um on cannabinoids or terpenes and so you know the takeaway there is eh, it doesn't matter you're just saving fertilizer cost right. sure but then, you know, they, they tried to do a smell test, and it, it was kind of hard, and I don't think they'd cured it yet. So, you know, there was a mm -hmm. lot of things that could be improved there. But, you know, these next steps that he's taken is actually, you know, they're still going to do a smell test, but more importantly, be able to look at chlorophyll, be able to look at the mm -hmm. sugar conversions and, nice. and put some nice. data behind that. So, yeah, Clemson's doing some really cool stuff. Oh, yeah. um, I'm excited. And it's all things that, you know – immediately relevant you know we're showing you there there's no loss in yield by saving fertilizer for right. a week you know let's do it stuff that not? can actually like save farmers money and they can actually exactly act on and that's always you know one of the criticisms that i think scientists in general get hit with is the claim that a lot of times we spend a ton of time measuring a lot of things that matter to a very small amount of people uh, and I think that's a a, a fair criticism because um, that is the case a lot. Um, yeah. So it's really nice to see um, research that's really targeted towards things that are applicable to producers, um, that are apl applicable to average people, and that can be understood by average people. It's another often criticism of scientists in general is we tend to write our papers for other scientists and not for right. people that could benefit from them. So, um, yeah, it's really cool to hear about that type of research going on and your involvement in that. And I wanted to check in with you because I noticed we went over um, the hour here. Are you still okay on time? Yeah. Okay, cool. I just didn't want to, if you had any meetings coming up or anything, I didn't want to mess you up. All good. Um, another thing I wanted to talk to you about, kind of taking a step back from harvesting and, and curing, I know you spoke recently about um, photosynthetic rates and how to measure photosynthesis in leaves and mm -hmm. how um, photosynthetic rates change sometimes in different tissues um, at different stages, for, you know, vegetative versus flowering. Um, so I wanted to ask you about that because that's some of the more recent things that I've, I've noticed you speaking about. Um, we didn't quite yeah. go in a linear progression here, but going back to the plant being alive. <laughs> um, yeah. What's some of the things that you've noticed there? Yeah. So that was a cool experiment. It's actually one we did not this past growing season, but the one before. Um, and that's, that's how long it took to, Oh, I know. You yeah. know write up our paper, yeah. find somebody that wanted to publish it, them to figure out which month it's going to go in. Um, yep. And so that's why I tell people, you know, even though even though the Clemson group will be publishing things that they do for CRC, it could take a year or two. And so that just puts you that far ahead of the game. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's, the game. Yeah. that's how it goes. Yep. So uh, let's see. Um, I'm trying to 
trying to think some of the takeaways. One of the takeaway was that my field needs more phosphorus. <laughs> <laughs> That's common in a lot of them. Which, yeah. which I knew, but they found it out. Um, Mike can use some mycorrhizal support. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, but they were able to identify that, and it was, you know, it was it was pretty neat how they were able to do it. Um, basically, you know, when you're, uh, I won't go into too much detail. Sure, I'm going to try sure. to put this as high level as possible. Basically, you know, photosynthesis, you're, you're bringing in CO2, you're making sugars, right? Well, if in your factory your workers are not there, then you're not going to turn it to sugar, Right. All right. Well, in, in, in our plan example, um, if you're phosphorus limited, it won't complete that circle of, of, of making sugars. And so the worker is not there. And so instead, an alternative pathway is created where oxygen is took up. Mm -hmm. And oxygen um, is just basically turned into, uh, it, it, you know, the plant's got to do something. So it takes up oxygen and it, it's a wasteful process that... Uh, you know, it, it doesn't do much with it. So, you know, if you're if you're short nutrition, you know, these are the sort of things that happen. And this is the sort of nitty gritty, uh, you know, a really cool piece of equipment can tell you, you know, without looking at a soil report. Yeah, uh, which is pretty cool. And and how does how does how is it measured? And and it's okay to get technical on this level because this is just me personally interested. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, what does the, the measurement process, uh, look like? Are you basically, um, like dissolving plant tissues and trying to look for indicators of components of the cycle or, uh... no, so it's, uh, it's a really cool piece of equipment that has a box and in the box is a genius computer. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, it's connected to a cord and you basically clamp the leaf not not to the point where you're breaking plant material okay yeah. but it, it, it 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 seals a portion of the leaf and from there um in that really high-tech box it has co2 scrubbers water scrubbers okay. and so it can okay. inject exactly what it wants to as far as co2 water i'm sure there's a couple other things but then within that leaf um, it's closed environment. And so the computer knows exactly what's going in and it can track exactly what's coming out of that leaf. And so by calculation, uh -huh. it can tell you the model conductance. It can tell you all sorts of cool things. It's basically a math equation at that point yeah. after it has all of, all of those, all the correlates and everything. all the, yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh man, that's fascinating. I need to find one of those to play with. Because uh, when, when I heard you <laughs> yeah. talk about it on another podcast, I was I was wondering um, kind of what that process looks like. Um, that's super interesting to find out. And and that study, um, it looked at this process through the whole transition of the life cycle, right, from vegetative mm -hmm. into flowering. And is there anything interesting that you noticed between those two cycles? Yeah, so it, it was for one variety, and it just so happened in that field. It's an interesting plan. I, I still can't pinpoint <laughs> yeah. the exact flower trigger. You know, it's not an auto flower. It is photoperiodic. I don't know. But take takeaway was we had we had three different uh, levels of maturity within flower with with this same variety, and. I guess, let's see, let's see. Takeaway one was, I guess this is two. Takeaway two is that vegetative cannabis is crazy efficient at photosynthesis. So, you know, it's up there with whatever, sunflower and corn. Whatever light as far you're throwing as, at it, it's integrating. Yes, it will, yes, you give it light, you give it CO2, and it will go to work. But, um, you know, th this this isn't necessarily a conclusion I could have came through myself with myself. This this is a, a photobiologist. You know, this is their skill set. <laughs> sure, yeah. The team at Lycor, um, you know, they say usually those plants 
the act in this manner that basic uh, let, let me let me put it into a, a common way um you know it, it it's a car that's driving and it, it it's slow to touch the brakes mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. whereas other plants with slower photosynthesis rates you know they're going slower but they can stop a lot a lot faster mm-hmm. and so they were able to show me that cannabis in this vegetative state mm-hmm. rapidly growing um that also means it's not conducive to drought, like in 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 the gotcha, environment, gotcha, in a natural gotcha. setting, yeah, yeah, yeah. because it's going so fast, it can't stop. And it'll to, keep going uh, even when conditions are not yes, favorable. Yes, it keeps going, but with the the plants in flower, and it increasing as a as the flower is increased, um, they they are much slower, and they can stop if if there's you know drought or some other stress. And so that was that was pretty cool to to see and find out. Um, yeah. And is it that is it the uh, that sort of dynamic? Does that hold up in flowering as well, or do you start to see like a kind of slowing down um, as the plant's starting to near the end of its life cycle, or any changes like that? Yeah, as the flower gets. Uh, much older, more mature, it does not photosynthesize as much. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the the CO2 that's added, the light that's added, it's not making use of it. That's basically what the system was able to tell us, that, hey, everything you give the vegetative plant, it's going to take it and go to work. Everything you give the mature, more mature plants, um, you know, they're going to just turn off their systems. Yeah. You know, that at a certain point, they've been tapped out. And so, you know, the conversion there for a farmer is that, hey, you know, there are some growers that the last couple of weeks, they turn lights down, mm-hmm. make it mm-hmm. colder. And so, you know, are we, are we just, are we just speeding up this senescence that we want? Right. Where our flower will Going back it. to flushing, too. Good. All these things <laughs> exactly. that combine. Yeah. Is this really just what we're doing? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Cool. But then, but then curveball, you know, after I had thought through that curveball, um, somebody said, well, well, maybe it's that the, the photosynthesis is transitioning from the leaves to the flower. So... You know, you think about growers uh, who strip the plants, you know, mm-hmm. when I first saw that years ago, I was, you know, I was screaming, thinking, ah, you know, the, the photo sales. Um, but uh, since I, have, okay. yeah, I've all the fan that, leaves that they're cutting off and everything yes. that they're dropping. And so off. if you think about the plant many times, especially outdoor, um, the plants will just start turn, turning colors anyways, right. even if you're not flushing, they'll yeah. start. And so that's the leaves then becoming the source you know, the plants stealing it out of the leaves, throwing it to the flower. There's obviously some photosynthesis still going on, and the flower's green. So there must be some photosynthesis, you know, that's that's transitioned from those fan leaves to the actual flower itself. And so that's where, you know, still work to do because yeah. the, the piece of equipment I was using, it only tests leaf at a certain moment. You know, what needs to be looked at next is instead of instead of it just being, you know, a square centimeter piece of leaf that we're mm-hmm. looking at, the whole plant's in a box. And right, then right. we know what's coming in out of it, and then that can be calculated. Well, you know, h- how much is the plant actually taking over? Or was the flower always photosynthesizing, and now it's just the fan leaves that are, are cutting off supply? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Interesting. But cool. Yeah. Something to think about. Yeah, definitely. More questions to ask. Um, mm-hmm. Well, that's fascinating. And, you know, moving into, we've kind of gone through your timeline all the way up until now, moving into the future, what are some things that are kind of um, at the forefront of your mind that you're really, some of the questions you're most interested in today compared to, you know, kind of where you've come from and what you've been wrangling with so far? You know, I think post-harvest work 
still has a lot. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, we've we've got a lot to do there. Um, you know, I, I truly think once we understand what's going on, we can optimize it. And right. so, you, you know, save is a that lot of money for people? Exactly. You know, can we can we dry and cure in one spot as long as the parameters of what's in and out is correct? Probably. Um, you know, still looking at the gases and how they affect certain things. Um, even though ethylene production does go down, you know, as the plant loses water, dies more. Right. Um, but if we if we changed ethylene during the drying, could that do anything? Mm, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I sit here and think we want to speed up the starch to conversion. If that's right, if know, that's, if what that's it is. the key, yeah. if that's the the key of what's going on here, if we want to speed that up. Well, those first five days or whatnot, the plant's still alive, producing a lot of ethylene. Do we want to pump it with more or yeah. do we want to pull that out? Because, you know, ripening is, is just uh, sugar conversion. So, you yeah. know, uh, definitely some more detailed work to look at there. Um, let's see. Let's see. Gosh, it's all over the place. What about There's on the, just so um, much to look at. What about on the extraction side? Let's see. Extraction side. You know, we the past couple of years, we've been doing a good bit with terpenes. Mm-hmm. And good gosh, is that complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's hard to eat on the analytical side, which is more of my background. It's hard to even know yeah. exactly what, you know, in antiomers and things you're, you're actually working with. Mm-hmm. You know, keeping... Uh, just the educational piece of showing a, a grower or talking through with a grower, you know, they say, I got this one flower, smells great, but when I extract it, it doesn't. Or mm-hmm. I've got this one flower, but depends who's growing it, it smells different every time. Yeah. And uh, and so I think we need to learn when what else is there, of course, besides the terpenes. And then two – you know, how much effect does each one of these steps have on on that end product? Yeah. You know, because there, there's <clears throat> parts of extraction, you know, you change up that time and pressure and heat, right. and you're going to affect that end product. Well, that's the same thing in the grow. You know, what time of day are you harvesting? Because um, look through the papers, and there's tons of research on, like, rainforests. Yeah. And they go out and capture samples in the morning and in yep. the evening. And the terpene profile is wildly different. Yeah. Um, same with some studies about herbs, you know, basil and things like yeah. that, that they do extract essential oils with. You know, they show um, if they harvest while the plant is in drought, it's going to be significantly different than if if it were watered properly yeah, the right. whole time. Um, and so, you know, working with, with people who produce terpenes, you know, really understanding those important pieces, you know, always harvest in the morning. Um, you know, cut water off two days before or something to yeah, that effect. Right. You know, I, I think I think it's going to be important for those who want something extremely consistent, whether it's right, terpene right. extraction or whether it's you know, the highest class flower in the whole world that they want it to smell the same every time. You know, it's not just the extractor's job. That's an important job, too. Yeah. That's where Marcus comes in. But all of these pre-pieces are are important as well. Yeah, definitely. And that just really highlights, yeah, this importance of understanding how handling is influencing the final product. Um, because people are getting more and more interested in these terpene profiles um, and starting to pay attention to them. And I always teach about this, but it, it is just fascinating how, um, sensitive they are, like just how, how much they can change so fast. And like you said, depending on the time of day, there's been some cool research, you know, you're talking about the, the rainforest research. There's been some cool boreal forest research as well, looking at climate change. And they're saying as these like boreal forests are warming up, we're seeing, uh, you know, basically terpene clouds, you know, forming around these right. forests. And um, one thing that's cool is as these like terpene clouds form around the forest, it actually protects them a little bit from UV radiation. But also, you know, um, 
you start to see changes in, in the chemicals that are in these clouds and, and things like that. And um, so finding ways to meet the, the customer's interest and expectations of consistency is uh, a lot tougher than I think people have given it credit for. It's one thing to get the cannabinoid profiles consistent, but the terpenoid profiles, um, it, it's really tricky. And this, this issue of having it smell different after extraction, you know, versus the flower run into that plenty of times and sometimes it's the extraction method but sometimes it's like I don't even know what it is it's like voodoo in the lab yeah. like I don't know I, don't, I genuinely don't yeah. know um but it, it can be really really remarkable um so yeah that's that's cool good things to focus on um all big questions and this this brings me around I, I meant to ask you about it earlier but I wanted to make sure to highlight it um, the research group that you um, mentioned before. Do you mind speaking just a little bit more about um, that group? And um, I just want to let people know like how to find information about the projects um, that y'all are working on and everything like that, because I think it's really important and really valuable, and I wanted to make sure to um, highlight it before we wrap up. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, so basically to look us up, you know, we're on social media, um, we have a website, CannabisRC.org, cannabis um, okay. CannabisRC.org, and that's where you can look us up, um, see what it takes to join. Like I said before, it's basically a, a membership, so uh, it's tiered, of course, because we've got, you know, we've got everything from one-acre hemp farmers to, yeah. you know, multi, multi-million dollar uh, multi-state companies in this group because, Everybody wants the same answers, and it, it should be tiered according to yeah. you know what what you bring in. Um, but that that annual fee um, supports myself usually with larger scale product projects, mm -hmm. um, as well as Clemson University and the grad students there uh, to work on these projects. And and you're able to give your feedback. You know, well, curing isn't important anymore. We don't care. You know, move on to this. <laughs> nice, yeah. um, so we, we really take the, the growers' feedback because that's what we're doing this for is immediate results. And like you said earlier, a lot of scientists like to just do science, to talk and brag and, you right. know, talk to other scientists, and that's great and all. But, you know, what this industry needs right now is farmers talking to each other, talking to scientists and coming up with ways for this industry to grow and, and move forward together. And so that money goes towards the research, but what, what we do in return is monthly webinars. Um, you know, you can shoot us questions anytime. We have an annual get together where we go even deeper into some of this research we're doing. Um, you know, we, we try to post as many open source papers as possible for the members. Uh, I know I'm forgetting something, but, you know, we, we really try to make it worth your time and effort, you know, for those yeah. who can't afford an R&D team or that have one yep. and just, you know, want to be at the cutting edge, you know, um, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, it really comes from the history of Dr. Faust and a floriculture research association he had for for flower growers. And oh, it, nice, it was fantastic. Nice. Yeah. You know, we would get together every year, learn what they're doing. Of course, everybody keeps not us and the CRC because it's, it's, it's meant for the, the members, but, um, you know, everybody shares what they're doing. Some people withhold trade secrets, sure. and that's fine. Of but, course. you know, um, we, we like to keep it very open and a, a place of science and sharing. Well, that's super cool. I Something that's been on my mind lately a lot, and I've been trying to wrestle with how to help in this regard myself, is how to connect small, particularly smaller natural products companies, you know, and primarily I come from cannabis, but I'm also thinking about other, uh, you know, farmers growing all sorts of other herbs and things, product manufacturers that are dealing with botanicals, how to connect them with scientific resources to get at answers that are important, you know, for that group. And like you mentioned, a lot of small companies, I mean, they don't have research R&D teams, or if they do, you know, very limited in resources they have. So, you know, finding um, organizations like that, that that's really the purpose is join and you, you know, have a team of people here that want to know what questions you have, that want to 
develop experiments to try to answer those questions and disseminate that information and talk about that information and really integrate it. Um, I think that's a, a huge service. So um, yeah, I just I'm stoked to see that. And um, it's something I hope to see more of. I think there's a lot of room for a lot more, you know, kind of um, expansions like satellites of that models, you know, very similar right. to that with uh, coordination between the universities and everything, um, which has been tough. I, I assumed when Mississippi launched medical marijuana that um, the University of Mississippi was going to be much more open to touching all this, but that has not been the case so far yet. <laughs> I, I showed up a little over optimistic um, and had some meetings with some folks over there, and they're like, yeah, the bureaucracy is still in place. <laughs> There's still oh, no. a, a lot of hoops <laughs> to jump through. We still get federal funding from a lot of things. So right, um, right. they're like trying. They, they started like a cannabis research center. Um, but it's, I think really they're angling for it to just be prepared for when federal, you know, decriminalization or whatever happens that they can, without risking their grants and everything, can, can really start to do things. Um, but I, you know, I'm stuck that Clemson has really stepped up and um, has not been afraid to do some of this. I've done a little bit of work with the University of Georgia. They've been trying to kind of here and there touch it when they can. Um, and so, I don't know, trying to get all of these stakeholders involved, the producers with researchers, with the universities, um, and just talking and sharing um, it can really benefit everybody in a lot of ways. Um, so, anyway, my hat's off to you for being involved in that and um, my hat's off to Clemson for being willing to be associated with it and, and do that. I think it's a huge service. So I hope anyone listening um, takes note of that and is inspired in some way to try to, if wherever you are, when you're listening to this, if you don't have anything like this um, and you're connected to a school or something, it's something to consider. Um, there are other models um, like this for other things, other plants and, and whatnot. And there are extension centers, you know, for agricultural science in general in most places. Um, so finding ways to really uh, take that model and make it possible for cannabis is highly worthwhile. Um, and I know I've kept you way over. We've been going almost an hour and a half now. Um, but I really appreciate you being willing to sit through it with me. I've really enjoyed the conversation. And um, the last thing I wanted to do bringing it back around to the hemp mine. Um, I want to give you the floor for the last couple of minutes here. Um, let folks know how to find the hemp mine and any other parting words of wisdom you want to share with our listeners before we sign off. Um, I'll give it to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and, and everybody listening and listening to the end. If you're hearing yes, me right now, absolutely. um, if you want to check out the hemp mine, um, we got a, we got an easy URL. It's just the hempmine.com. Um, you can check us out online. Um, I, I try to upload as much science research and interesting things as I can to our Instagram. That's the hemp mine, but then also my my personal. Um, it's dr dot justice underscore grows, and I, I try to I try to include some interesting things, bug pictures, and uh, yeah, just interact and connect. But we we sell plant varieties, plant genetics, and also consumer goods. So check us out. Shoot me an email. Um, i love to connect with the community. Perfect. Awesome. Well, yeah, everybody, if you made it to the end, thanks so much. And um, as always, if you want to check out more about Curious About Cannabis, you know where to find us, cacpodcast.com. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube, all of the above. Uh, so with that, everybody, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Allison, for joining us, and I will catch you all again next time. Stay curious and take it easy. Bye-bye.